I'm a mammal, you're a mammal, we're all mammals. Mammals dominate the animal world around us to a great extent and did so already for a long time prior to the remarkable innovations that have accrued through our genus's history. Mammals arose in the aftermath of the demise of many creatures, most notably the dinosaurs, at the end of the Cretaceous. They'd existed for a long time prior, and even saw some members adapt to arboreal and semi-aquatic lifeways. But despite stirrings of diversification, they belong to a world filled with others. But now, as before, when the Paleozoic era came to an end with the Permian extinction and a whole new swath of life types came to characterize a prolonged period, so too now with the end Cretaceous extinction, the life types that typify the Mesozoic no longer dominate the terrestrial scene insofar as they exist at all. The life that I'm concerned with framing in this video is that of the mammals who are the dominant animal life on land today. That is, the life that would most comprise the stereotypical big land life we'd show in future museums dedicated to land life of this period. Most mammalian species aren't big, however. Rodents and bats, in fact, take gold and silver respectively for leading species possessors of the mammalian orders. As we look around today, mammals are of a number of types. We have the few and far between, just five species, monotremes. Then there are the marsupials, who make up over 300 species. And finally, the most common by far, comprising well over 5,000 species, are the placentals. In total, despite the more modest implications intimated by the aforementioned estimates, in total, there are, and this is just what we know so far, 6,514 species of mammal alive in the world right now. Placental mammals themselves are further broken down into Boreoeutheria, Aprotheria, and Xenarthra. We'll take a closer look at the story of all the aforementioned mammal types, but it's crucial to keep in mind that early on, none of these groups familiar to us were dominant, and instead, as was the case for the prior Cretaceous, the most common mammals around were the multi-tuberculates. So let's start with their story, and then consider the less dominant, but more important to us, mammals during the early stages of the Cenozoic era. As the ancestral forms of those mammals we know today came to be, and as mammals more broadly gained their footing in the newly decimated world. Multituberculates had been the most diverse mammalian order of the Mesozoic. As they entered the Paleocene, they had already been in an adaptive radiation for at least 20 million years, and they peaked in the early Paleocene. One well-known genus of the Paleocene was the 12 to 20 inch Tylidus of North America, who appears to have been a good climber. North America also saw the relatively large multituberculate Catopsilus during the Paleocene. The largest known multituberculate also comes from Paleocene North America in the form of Taniolabus, more specifically Taniolabus tauensis, who may have weighed over a hundred kilograms. The Kogai Onidae are a family of multituberculates who got started off in the late Cretaceous, constrained to Hatseg Island, and now spent the Paleocene expanding across Europe. After peaking in the early Paleocene, and having spent at least 88 million years of dominance over most mammalian assemblies, multituberculates entered a long-term decline they wouldn't recover from, and just beyond the area of our consideration in the early Oligocene, this mammal lineage disappeared. Placentals. Afro- Theria. Early in the Cretaceous, placental mammals split into four. The first to split off were Afrotheria, who then continued their evolutionary history in Africa. Nowadays, this clade has various members, from elephants to sea cows to golden moles and aardvarks. 
the earliest fossil Afrotherians appear in the middle Paleocene, and the earliest skulls are that of the two species of Osepia, known from the middle and late Paleocene, respectively. Following the phylogeny shown here, let's break it down. P. nungulata has three orders remaining alive, all of which appear in the time period under discussion. There are the Hyracoidea, which bring us the Hyraxes. Hyracoids appear in the Eocene, and two Eocene examples who would live beyond the Eocene are Titanohyrax and Megalohyrax. The second P. nungulata order are Probosidea, which bring us to the elephants. The earliest Probosideans aren't large, and they enter the scene in the late Paleocene. The earliest one is also the smallest, Erytherium. Phosphotherium is next, and they too were small, with an estimated shoulder height of about a foot and a body mass of 37 pounds. In the Eocene, we start seeing much larger examples, such as Barotherium, who weighed around 2 tons and stood over 6 feet tall. Also of interest from the Eocene is the stubby-legged semi-aquatic Moritherium, reaching 2.3 feet in height and weighing around 500 pounds. Also from the Eocene, and looking more like modern-day elephants, are the just under 4.5 feet tall Phiomia, whose nasal bones suggest a short trunk, and then there's the larger Paleomastodon, who weighed some 2.5 tons and reached 7 feet 3 inches upward. The third Penungulata order alive today are Cyrenia, leaving one dugong species and three manatee species. Cyrenians date back to the early Eocene, with the earliest example known as the walking manatee, Pezosiren. Other Eocene early Cyrenians include Sobrow Besserin and Prorastamus. Now let's turn to Afroinsectophilia, which also arrives today with members from three surviving orders. For one, there's Tubuli dentata, whose only remaining species is the aardvark. Tubuli dentata does not yet show up in the fossil record of the Paleocene and Eocene. Next up in Afroinsectophilia is Macrosolidia from where we get one of the fastest small animals alive today, the elephant shrews. It's thought that the divergence between Macrosolidia and the other remaining Astroinsectophilia order, Afrocerizida, occurred in the Paleocene, though the fossil record for Macrosolidia only goes back as far back as the Eocene. Afrocerizida in the modern world brings us the golden moles, otter shrews, and tenrex. Xenarthra. After the Afrotherians had split off, next to go was Xenarthra, who became isolated in South America. Xenarthra includes creatures like anteaters, tree sloths, and armadillas, totaling to 31 extant species. The earliest undisputed Xenarthran comes as the late Paleocene highly derived Euteetus. Xenarthra is comprised of two orders, Singulata and Pylosa. Within Singulata, the family Dasypodidae remains, with one genus containing seven species alive today, and the family Clamiphoridae, which includes more species, remains as well. And there's also the extinct family of Pampotheridae. All three of these might have appeared in the Eocene. Maclidotherium and Eruotherium are Eocene cingulates, possibly belonging to Pampotheridae. Clamophoridae may have picked up its own lineage in the Eocene as well. From the Eocene arrives the earliest Dasypodidae, with one of the earliest examples being a Stegotherium, and another Eocene example is Prostegotherium. Now let's move on to the second order of Xenarthra, Pylosa. Within Pylosa, we'll start with the suborder Vermilingua, in which there are the two families of anteaters, Cyclopedidae and Myrmecophagidae. 
Only four species remain, though if it turns out that the silky anteater truly ought to be broken into multiple species, that changes. Anteaters aren't known to have originated until after this period, though what's now generally thought of as a stem pangolin, Eurotamandua, was initially fancied an anteater. Lastly is the suborder Folivora, where we find the sloths, who nowadays consist of two surviving genera totaling six species. For the Paleocene and Eocene, Folivora hadn't emerged. Boreo Eutheria. With Afrotheria split off and evolving in Africa, and Xenarthrans finding themselves isolated in South America, those remaining in the Northern Hemisphere went their own way, and they are the Boreo Eutheria. Ancestral Boreo Eutherians were scrotum havers, and with a few exceptions, modern ones are too. Boreo Eutheria itself splits into the Laurasia Theria and Euarchontogliers. It's from within the latter of those two that primates came to be. Let's start with the former, Laurasia Theria. Laurasia theria is further subdivided into Eulipotypha and Scrotifera. Jumping into Eulipotypha, the very oldest ones date to the Paleocene, going family by family. Aranacidae, the first family we'll look at, brings us hedgehogs and gymnurs. Aranacidae picked up in the Eocene. Silvicola being an early example, and being roughly the length of an adult thumb, it's the smallest Aranacid ever found. The next family we'll look at is Sericidae, the shrews. They pick up in the Eocene as well, with the earliest examples being members of the subfamily Heterosericinae, whose records date back to the Middle Eocene of North America. Now the Talipidae family, or the moles. They too date back to the Eocene, with Eotalpa of the late Eocene. As for the venomous Solenodontidae family, and their now dead relative family of Nisophontidae, the Eocene is when their lineage is estimated to have split and gone their separate ways. Now on to Scrotifera, let's start with Chiroptera, or the bats. Chiroptera dates back to the Eocene, with the earliest definitive examples coming as the Eocene Icaronycterus and Oniconycterus. The first fossil mammals to have their color determined are also bats dating to the Eocene. Two of the three are Paleochiropteryx and Hashenicterus. Now for the sister group to the order Chiroptera, we have Pharyngulata, a grand order of placental mammals that groups together Theory and Panyuangulata. Let's take a closer look at Panyuangulata, or all the true ungulates. Living ungulates are divided into two orders, Perisodactyls, or odd-toed, that is one or three-toed ungulates, such as horses and rhinos, and artiodactyls, or even-toed, that is two- or four-toed ungulates, such as cattle, pigs, deer, and hippos, as well as the non-hooved cetaceans, like whales and dolphins. Artiodactyls arose in the Eocene. The earliest examples come from the basal group Dicobunity in the early Eocene, such as Diacodexus. Artiodactyls. First, let's meet the suborder Tylopoda, non-ruminant artiodactyls, the surviving family of which are Camelidae. Among other Tylopoda, the Eocene saw Oromericidae, Mericoidodontidae, and Xiphodontidae. Next, let's consider the suborder Suina, which includes the domestic pig and peccaries of the families Suidae and Taiusuidae, respectively, neither of which emerged until after the Eocene. Beyond Suina, let's consider the other member of the Arteofabula clade, Cetrumenantia, and let's start with Whipomorpha, which includes all living cetaceans and hippopotamuses along with their extinct relatives. Hippopominids didn't arrive until after the Eocene. 
but they're descended from Anthracotheridae, which did appear in the Eocene, and among the earliest showing up, starting in the Middle Eocene, is Elamorex. As for cetaceans, they nowadays total around 90 species of whale, dolphins, and porpoises. They're split into two parvorders, Adontocidae, or tooth whales, and the filter-feeding Mystocidae, or baleen whales. These two divisions are thought to have split around the end of the Eocene. The Archaeocidae represent the earliest cetacean radiation, and they come on board in the early Eocene. There's Pachycetidae of the early Cretaceous, there are the Ambulocetidae, who, while retaining large hind limbs, may have been fully aquatic. Joining the mix of the Eocene as well were the Remingtonocetidae, Protocetidae, and Basilosauridae. We now leave Whipomorpha and consider Ruminantia. Ruminant comes from the Latin for chew over again and refers to the process by which these creatures consume food which then passes into their fore stomach, they regurgitate it and then swallow it again, thereby extracting the nutrients far more thoroughly. The ruminant story would become more significant when they started seeing more success in the later Miocene, and some 200 species are alive today. They appeared earlier though in the Eocene, some Eocene examples are Leptomorex and Hypertragulus. That's it for Artiodactyls, and now for the other ungulate order, the odd toad, Perissodactyls. Perissodactyla brings us the horses and related animals, tapirs and rhinoceroses, all contributing to total 17 species. Equidae includes horses, asses, and zebras, as well as many fossils dating back to the Eocene. Some examples dating from the Eocene are Epihippus and Haplohippus of the subfamily Eohippinae. Another is Proterohippus of the Propaleotherinae subfamily. Another subfamily, Inkcitherinae, appeared in the Eocene, with its earliest example being the 60 centimeter tall Mesohippus. Now for Tapiridae, the first true tapers arose after the Eocene, but the Eocene did see taperoids around, with examples like Heptodon and Helilides of the early Eocene. As for the Rhinoceratidae, the Eocene saw their advent, and more broadly for Rhinoceratoidea, in which Rhinoceratidae is the only survivor of four families, Hyracodontidae and Aminodontidae got started in the Eocene, and the earliest Paraceratheridae hadn't shown up. These early Rhinoceratoidea were modestly sized and faster moving. That's the broad stroke of the ungulates. For the other half of Ferungulata, there's the Fury, or wild beasts. First, let's consider Folidota, from whom we have three current genera, totaling eight species. The broader Folidota morpha includes the even earlier pangolin-like Paleanodonta. Numerous Philodota come from the Eocene, such as Eomanus and Eurotamandua. Lastly, for Laurasia theria, there's Carnivora, an around 280 current species order, characterized by flesh-tearing teeth, and includes cats, dogs, seals, and hyenas. Stem carnivorans pick up in the early Paleocene with the genida Ravenictus and Pristinictus. The diversification into the two extant groups, caniforms and filiforms, occurred in the Eocene. For a likely close relative of Carnivora, we have the carnivorous Creodonta, who comprise 16 genera and lived in the Paleocene, Eocene, and beyond. Other carnivorous non-carnivorans of the time included Mesonychia, whose members for the most part filled a fast-running predator ecological niche and lasted in the Paleocene, Eocene, and just beyond. There are the less derived Mesonychids, such as Inkilagon, Mesonyx, and Yanxia. Only one Mesonychid genus made it beyond the Eocene, Mongolestes. 
And then there are the more derived haplodectids like Haplodectes, Honinodon, and Lohudon. No haplodectids appear beyond the Eocene. With Laurasia theria in the rear view, we now consider the second major division of Borio eutheria, Uarchontogliers. Let's begin with the end part of that term, gliers. Gliers include Rodentia, the most species rich group providing us around 2,000 living rodents. And then there is Lagomorpha, where we get rabbits. Early examples of rodents, like the Eocene Paramus, already had the deeply rooted front incisors. Even earlier, picking up in the Paleocene and lasting into the Eocene is the family Allegomyidae. Laporidae is the family of rabbits and hares. They, along with Ocotonidae, the pikas, make up Lagomorpha. One Eocene Lagomorph who displays a mosaic of characters typical of both groups and is often thought to be a close relative of the last common ancestor of living Laporidae and Ocotonidae is Paleologus. Those are the Gliers. Now let's consider the Uarchanta. Uarchanta includes the tree shrews, the colligos or flying lemurs or dermopterans, and most importantly from our center, primates. The order Scandentia consists solely of tree shrews, for whom fossils are incredibly rare. There is a claim for a tree shrew during this period with the Eocene Eodendrogoli parva. Beyond that claim, if true, no tree shrews are known from this period. Dermopterans do show up with Dracontolestes of the Paleocene and Dermotherium, who shows up in the late Eocene. And lastly, for Boreo eutheria and placental mammals more broadly, primates. A possible proto-primate is the alleged plesiodapiform purgatorius of the early Paleocene. In the late Paleocene, there is Altiatlasius, and spanning the Paleocene-Eocene boundary is the primate-like Plesiodapus, or near Adapus. The Adapiform primate Adapus comes in the late Eocene. A more famous Eocene Adapiform is the Middle Eocene Darwinius. Another group of Eocene primate are the Omimiidae, including Necrolemur, Tailhardina, and Anaptomorphinae. Before moving on from placental mammals, let's consider some enigmatic taxa. As I was preparing this video, I came to recognize that many Paleocene mammals remain ambiguously classified, and that's led to me ignoring some very important creatures. So to partially remedy that, I'm going to offer a brief accounting of non-easily placed Paleocene mammals. I'll mostly be following a portion of the paper on screen for this section. A wastebasket taxon for ungulates, which are not established as part of either Parasodactyla or Artiodactyla, is Condylarthra, and these comprise by far the largest component of Paleocene mammalian biota. There is the Arctocyonidae family, consisting of more than 20 genera, primarily of Europe, including Arctocyon primevis, Cryacus, and Mentoclanodon. There is the family Periptychidae, who stands out among Condylarthra with their swollen premolars and unusual vertical enamel ridges. They consist of some 15 genera, among which are Periptychus, who is one of the earliest known crown placental mammals, and Ectoconus. Also with some 15 genera, there's the family Hyopsodontidae. They pick up in North and South America in the Paleocene, and in the Eocene, they've reached Europe and Asia. An Eocene member from North America is the type species Hyopsidus. Then there's the 14 genera among North American Phinacodontidae, with members such as Phinacodus and Tetraclanodon. Next, there are the at least three orders of South American native ungulates, Xenungulata, Nodoungulata, and Lytopterna. Moving beyond these ungulate types, let's consider Leptictida, whose members transverse the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. From the Cretaceous, we have Gypsum ictops, and for the period under discussion today, two Eocene examples include Leptictidium and Leptictus. 
another important group straddling the end Cretaceous start Paleogene boundary as well are Simolestidae, in which are 13 genera, not counting the 35 genera of what is possibly a suborder of Simolestidae, Panthodonta. In contrast to the Simolestids, these were large ground dwelling herbivores. And they came on board in the Paleocene. Examples from then include Panto Lambda and Titanoides. Pantodonts lasted until near the end of the Eocene when they disappeared. Eocene examples are Coryphodon, Barry Lambda, and the latest, Hypercoryphodon. Marsupials. Marsupials are generally considered to be more closely related to placentals than to monotremes. Marsupials are the survivors of the Metatherian lineage, with Metatherians including all those more closely related to marsupials than to placentals. And in the early Cenozoic, and in fact beyond the time covered in this video as well, we still have Metatherians that aren't marsupials, such as Pucadelphus of the Paleocene, and examples from the Eocene include Paratherium and Herpototherium. Metatherians had been hit harder than the multituberculates and eutherians in the end Cretaceous extinction and would be slower to recover. Existing marsupial orders are Didelphimorphia of South American origin, that is the order of opossums, which didn't get going during the period under discussion. The two other American orders see their origin in the Paleocene, however, Microbiotheria, which has only one species remaining, Monito del Monte of southwestern South America, the earliest instance of this order comes in the early Paleocene with Casia. Then there's Posse tuberculata, which nowadays includes just seven true opossum species, whose earliest example comes from the late Paleocene. As for the four surviving Australasian marsupial orders, the good at foraging through loose sand Notoryctidae with the marsupial moles, then there's Dasuromorphia, in which most Australian carnivorous marsupials, like quolls and the Tasmanian devil, find themselves. Then there's Paramelomorphia, consisting of the bandicoots and bilbies, and finally, the largest extant marsupial order, including kangaroos, wallabies, koalas, and others, the Diprodontia. All of these orders start appearing in the fossil record of the Oligocene, or after the Eocene. Marsupials moved into Australia in the Eocene, with the earliest known one being the early Eocene Australian, Jarthia. Monotremes. Monotremes are the earliest of the surviving lineages of mammals, that is, including marsupials and placentals. While survivors are indigenous to Australia and New Guinea, examples from the Cretaceous and Paleocene include ones from South America. We introduced a couple of the merely handful of Cretaceous monotreme examples in the previous video. Now in the Paleocene, the record remains sparse. The only known monotreme that I could find is Monotremonum, who is known from the Salamanca formation of Argentina. And there you have it. There is a brief overview of the story of mammals in the Paleocene and Eocene, including the start of a number of orders that we see around us today. If you like the video, consider liking it, consider subscribing, consider supporting me on LiberaPay or PayPal, links in the description, and I'll see you in the next one.